Okay, guys, welcome back. Let me first share some answers to questions that you just asked me. Uh, number one, for your homework. What I am asking you to do in the homework is basically two things. Number one, you need to create a method output in the basic neural network that I shared with you, the one that you use for the first homework. Uh, this method output, the only goal is just similar to the output method in the library that we're reviewing. That method receives as a parameter a set of inputs, like the testing data set, right? and return the outputs, the results that your neural net creates for those inputs. Do you remember that part, right? The only thing there is I am asking you to store that result in kind of an array and return that array. I am not asking you to use the fancy END vectors that we're reviewing with the library. I am not asking you to mix the basic neural network code with the library. That is not the idea. It's just modify the code that you have and create a method that returns output for a particular input. Your parameter can be an array, your output can be an array. It is not the best thing to do. That is the reason because we are reviewing the library. But for your neural net with XOR, AND, and so on, it's good to go. Second, the only reason because I am asking you to create this method is then you can use that output as an input for a method eval in a class eval. Again, I am asking you to create a class eval with the method eval, not the one in the library that already exists. I am not asking you to use that one. I am asking you to create a new one. Remember, like create your own uh, linked list or stack or queue. I am asking you to check what is inside. In that method, I am asking you to calculate the confusion metric, recall, accuracy, precision, F1 score. My goal is that you can calculate those values, know how to program the calculation of the values. Now, a question there is, do you need to care about multiple classes? My answer is no. Uh, I am asking you to implement this eval class for your simple neural network code. So it is okay if you have a confusion metric two by two, the simple one. It is okay if you hard code the storage of that, like an, a bidimensional array of two times two, or you can use an array one dimension of four elements. Up to you. I am not going to review that part of your code. The only thing that I want is to, for you to use those elements for the calculation, to implement the calculation. Now, I make a mistake before. Someone asked me about how to calculate uh, the precision and the recall. And the question in particular was, something about a division by zero. I just want to be sure, and I didn't follow with the answer right now. It's like, there is no cases in which you are going to have a division by zero in the recall and the precision. My point is, remember, your division is something like the first element divided by the first plus the second, right? Remember? So just because that, if you have a number here, it doesn't matter that the others are zero, but it's going to be kind of the number divided by the number. So it's going to be one. Never the addition is going to give you zeros, unless you have zero here. That is the only scenario in which everything could be zero if all these zero elements are there. And obviously for that scenario, if you have zero there, and therefore everything is zero, well, you report so that is the only scenario in which zero is a number below. You know that you be careful with that. Uh, it's not going to be the case for your neural net, but you be careful with the validation. Good. So the calculation, the class, the output. Any questions? You're good. Okay. So moving forward. So far, we create a neural network from scratch. We know what is inside. I can talk with you about the elements, and you know what I am talking about, where they are working. Then we move to a library. Previous lecture, uh, we review oh, the previous one before starting with the metrics. 
we review the library, and the thing that I follow with you is to implement exactly the same thing that you did from scratch, but now with the library. And hopefully you notice it's like, okay, makes sense. We know what is inside of the library, and now at least you create a hello world with the library. But honestly, we use a very powerful library to print hello world. Kind of disappointing, I know, don't worry. So can we continue using the library to do something more interesting? And how different is going to be that something more interesting, quotation mark, from the thing that we already did? I mean, really, all that class that we, that we use, checking how to create the X or with the library, Make sense? Let's check. Today, I want to go back to the library and I want to use the library for image recognition. That sounds like more interesting than the XR, right? Hopefully. Anyway, so let's see. According with this, the only thing that we need to do for machine learning, in particular, now that we're working with neural nets, is those five steps. Uh, we need data. Uh, before the data was the XOR tables. Uh, we want to work with images. I think we're going to need data, image. Makes sense. Uh, we need to create a model. The model is our neural net. How many nodes, how many layers, how many inputs, how many outputs. We need to decide that kind of the data structure. When we have the model, the data structure, we need to train the model. Train the model is a fancy name for calculate the Ws, the bias, and so on. All these constants. And then when we have that, we train the model. Obviously, we need to calculate those values to the best of our possibilities. Then we can test the model. Like, okay, let's check what the model do. Test the equations that we create. It's an equation system. And we can test that with the confusion metrics, the recall, the precision, the F1 score. The only reason because I am mentioning this, and I spent a whole lecture talking about them, is because now in my slides, I can show you the confusion metric and the value for those metrics. And you can tell me that is good or not. That is better than the previous one or not. Now I can show you the numbers and you know what those numbers represent, good? And finally, the step number five, when we have a model that is good enough, we can use that model in an application. I put the number five in blue because I am not going to talk yet about the deployment. Uh, so far, what we are doing is not deployment. All this testing, training, and so on, is we're creating the model. Uh, so far, I haven't asked you to put a model inside of a real application, a program that does something else that use uh, show numbers, percentages. So number five is outside of the topic today, maybe for a week. Let's check the one to the four. But now our problem is image recognition instead of use export. Good. Okay, number one, the data. We did this before. This was our data before. Our data before was we create from scratch these powerful arrays, and we put there these zeros and ones. From previous slide, that was our data, the picture. Those are our instructions for put that picture in the memory. Previous lecture, we create a model. That was our model. And hopefully you remember, and I can show you the source code above, and you remember is the picture below. We understand the match between that source code, the Fluent Builder uh, there working to create an object for configuration. And that one is basically doing that picture. And finally, we tested, and hopefully we remember and we understand 100% the blue rectangle, the confusion metric and the other four numbers. That is where we are, good? Okay, pictures with neural network. Uh, step number one, according with my description, we need input, right? Okay, for images, you tell me before, what are going to be our input? 
the pixels. <coughs> and it's pretty simple. A picture is a two-dimensional array of pixels. Now, two possibilities. Number one, each pixel can be a zero or a one if we have a black and white image. Or each pixel can be three numbers, LGB or four numbers, LGBA, representing that particular pixel. That is going to be our input. Images, numbers. The numbers that correspond to zero, one for the pixel, or to a vector of values, LGB, for the pixel. That is very important because if we reduce images to numbers, can you agree that everything that we covered before these equations are just going to work in the same way? Let's think about black and white images. Black and white images is exactly the same thing that we had before with the zeros and ones for the X or. Color, a little bit more interesting, but still numbers, vectors instead of scalars. Good news. Do you remember what we did? Addition and multiplication. Mostly our equations, addition, multiplications, even the derivatives and so on, scalars and vectors. Addition can be done with both. Multiplication can be done with both. And everything that we call can be done with both. Are we going to do that from scratch? No, don't worry. But exactly the same thing is going to happen. Now, what do we need? We need rows that represent the pixels. Ah, think about this image. Ah, the computer didn't see this one as a three by three array. What you have is pixel number one, number two, number three, number four, number five, number six, seven, eight, nine. What you have is a row. But it's going to have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten columns. And the values for each of the columns is going to be the value here. Uh, you can imagine black and white. And those values are going to have here a label. And the label could be uh, this is a circle. And if you continue, you can have a bunch of images, but they are just one row in a table. Exactly the same as the XOR before, but the XOR was two of these guys. Now we have a lot. So many, as many pixels in your image. We don't care about the position of the pixels. The computer is not looking at the circle. It uses information. The circle is exactly the same that any other numbers that you can have here. Your grades, if I want to predict whether or not you're going to pass, if I want to predict whether or not this is a circle, or if I want to calculate the X or operator, is use a row with data. Good. Okay, so if we want to do image recognition, what we need is this input. Okay, uh, and the label. Uh, what do we need to do with this? <clears throat> Four steps. That is my data set, remember? Uh, we call data set with this combination of these nine numbers and the label that correspond to the other. The table, that Excel file in my data set. And the first thing that I need to do is put that in the memory because I am going to need it. That is what you did as step number one with the data for the XOR. Put the information that one in the memory. Second, using that, you are going to do the training and then save the model and put the model in the application. 
load the data set, load this thing. <coughs> well, I am sure that the first thing that you are thinking is loading the data set. Uh, for the XOR, it was pretty easy. For the pictures, uh, we're going to do a program to do image recognition. Uh, we need data to train that model. So we need pictures. And we need those pictures to have a label. So you want to identify markers. Okay, you need a bunch of pictures and label markers for computers or tables or students or your faces or whatever, right? Uh, two options, obviously. Option number one, you can collect your data. You can go outside and take pictures of markers, computers, people. Uh, you need to be sure that your data cover all the possibilities. <clears throat> If you want to identify students, you need to be sure that your data cover a balance between female and male and so on. Age, professor, student, I don't know, nationality, racial expression. Or if really the thing that you want, like we want right now, is to learn about the model, uh, we can use data that is just available there data that someone else create a public data set do you think that there are public data sets like collection of pictures of markers tables people a lot a lot uh, some examples remember that i mentioned this idea to identify the numbers zero to nine a very famous data set with numbers. Okay, uh, what about identifying flowers? In particular, that kind of flowers. There is a data set for flowers. Oh, what about identifying other kind of images, like images of the marker? There is a data set for that one. A picture of things. Uh, no, 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 wait, wait, wait. What about to identify uh, faces? There is a data set for faces. Uh, okay, no, wait. I want to identify if there is a border in the image. Because, you know, I want to identify collision things. There is already a data set about fragments of truth, whether or not there is a collision, a border or not. Just to give you some examples. Now, those are the only ones, really? I mean, those didn't cover what I need. Don't worry. This is just one link. This is just one place. University of California. If you go to that link, almost 600 <coughs> different data sets that you can explore and are publicly available, including the previous one that I mentioned, well, at least the link to those ones. I think we're okay with the data, right? We do not need to go and collect data. Again, it's something that maybe you want to do, but it's something that usually you engineers do not do. There, is, there are other people taking care of the data because they need to take care about several different specifications about the data. Usually you are going to work with the data that someone else collected, either public data sets or the company, the specific company data set collected across several years or several people working on use that. Good. Okay. So problem number two, if the data sets are there, what is the format of the information? Uh, because thinking that the information is in that format, like this Excel table or comma separated values, is a very naive idea. <clears throat> what are going to be the format of the data set? There are a bunch of options. Because the data is different, the data set itself is going to be different. The format that the people use, one team, another one, they are going to select the format. Now, no problem. But the only thing that we need to do is to get the data set. And hopefully, the people that put the data set public is also going to make public the format of the data. Right? So 
Step number one, I need to read that, the format of the data, and then figure out how to load that data in my program. Two ways to load the data. Number one, from scratch. From scratch, yes, uh, read the file, is text file or binary file, separate the values, Either you need a parse for XML, or you need a parse for JSON, or you need a parse for common separate values. Separate. And then put the data in arrays. Your goal is to have the data in arrays. Parsing and reading is used work that you need to do. However, maybe, just maybe, what if you have a library that already has implemented the methods to load some formats of data. What if the library already has all this work that someone else did to parse and store this particular data set in arrays? It could be a good option to use that, right? Again, not because you do not know how to load the data, because you know how to read a binary file or a text file, you know how to do the parsing, JSON, XML, comma separate values, and moreover, you know it. But if it's already done, I can focus my attention in the machine learning part, not in reading data. Good news for the data sets that I mentioned to you, this one, at least, the library that we are using have support to load the data. For this, at least, the library is not going to ask you to work from scratch. There is already support for you, methods that you can use in the library. Remember that the library have three big parts. One was the neural net. One was the support for storage of the data the ND vectors, but the other one for the inputs, remember? And for the inputs, one of the most important things is methods to read the data. So all of them, we can use them. The only thing that we need to know is which are the methods that we need to call. Don't worry, we're going to work with that. To start, I want to use the first one. Uh, let's identify numbers. It's a very simple image, but it's something that we can check later if they work or not. We're going to use that data set. Okay. This is the data set that we're going to use. Uh, I just want to be sure that we understand what is the data set. Uh, I can show you this picture. And you can get the idea that the data set is going to have a bunch of numbers, zero to nine, that different people create. It's a picture of the number, it's an image. Now, the only thing that I want to be sure is the data set itself is every single one of these. And every single one of these is a picture 28 by 28 bit. So you have a bunch of them. Yeah, looks really nice when I present it like, oh, all the examples of zeros and ones and twos, but it's not what is inside of the computer. Inside of the computer, it's a table like that one. Uh, tell me, how many columns here for those numbers? <coughs> Do we know? 28. 28? 28 by 28. 28 by 28, which means? 28. Can you give me the result? Seven. Calculator. Seven. What? Yes. Professor, why 28 by 28? I want you to remember this number, 7A4. It's going to be in some place later. We have 784 columns because each column is one pixel in one of the small images. Yeah. And every one of these numbers is a row in that table. 
So this is just a bunch of examples of rows here. And what do you think is the label? These are my X and this is going to be my Y. What is going to be my Y? This one? The Y is going to be more. This is a nine. This is an eight. This is a seven. This is a zero. This is a five. The label is the number that we identify correspond to that image. Make sense? Output, one number. The number represents the category. If you want to think about this, what I want here is nine, eight, seven, and so on. That is the category. That is what that pixel represents. And my input. Good. Clear? Now, we're going to work with this, but think about this other data set. Five for 10. What if what I have is exactly these images? Now I put a mark here. Pixels. How many inputs? Pixels by pixels. Could be more if the image have better resolution or less if you have a low resolution image. Better resolution, more inputs, the better. But also more work to train your model because more operations that you need to do. And at the end, instead of a category that goes zero to nine, the categories, the name of some element in the picture, something that the picture represents. We're working with neural networks, simple, basic, trivial neural networks. So far, what we are doing is to identify a picture of one object. Professor, what happens if we have a picture and there are several objects there? Uh, we need something more complex. The next step of neural network, convolutional neural network. But we're going to talk about that later. Right now, I am focusing neural network. Right now, I am focused the picture is one object. That's it. Clear. Okay. So my data set. This one. Okay. Good. Uh, you want to get the data set, two options, University of California, but this particular data set, very famous, have its own website. So you can search for the data set website and is there. It's a public data set. You can get the data set. You can get the data set and then obviously you can load the data set. However, you do not need to do that. Uh, because what? Uh, I can get the data set. I can have the data set in my computer. What if I have a library and get the data set for me? What if the library already knows the address of the data set? Obviously, you need an internet connection, but I am sure that you have it. And the library itself can connect and get the data from that public site. Obviously, the assumption is that the address of the site is something that the library knew because the author of the library keeps that address in some of constant inside and the constant is valid, right? If by any chance the website goes down or the address change, your library is going to fail. But if not, think about the power. You want to use the data set? Yes, you can get it if you want it. But you can even use the data set without knowing where the data set is. You can imagine what's happening in the code, right? A URL connection in Java that is going to get a stream of data. We do not need to go down. Now, why I am going to use this? Why this is famous? It's usually like your hello world for training models, for practicing with models, because of the following. This data set is very old. Uh, several people have used the data set with different approaches, not only with neural networks. We're playing with neural networks and we're going to use this to do something. But in general, if you use this data set, you can easily create a neural network 
with only one layer and a few nodes, and you get 0 0.012 error. 12% error. Uh, the most trivial, well, no, a trivial, simple neural net with one layer and a few nodes can give you 12% error. A convolutional neural network, something more pro, best case scenario can give you 0.25% error. Tell me, do you remember what was kind of the minimum good value that we're looking for? Okay. Uh, do we identify why the 12% is kind of very bad, right? And the other is kind of very good. 0 0.5 to 0, 0 0.25 looks like, okay, there is a difference there. Remember that number because we're going to create a model and we're going to create a model with this as a set. Let's see where our model is going to be, but those two are kind of the worst case scenario and best case scenario. If you tell me that you did a model with one neural net and you get a better result, a better performance than 0, 0, 0.025, uh, something is wrong with your problem. Believe me. Okay. You can get worse than 12%? Yes, you can. You can do something worse. Uh, something better with only one layer is going to be something that I do not believe you. Now, okay. Our picture. Number one, the numbers. These numbers, this is kind of one number in the data set. They are black, white, yeah. and gray. There are no colors in those. So there are no colors involved. Two options. We can use the data set and we can think about each of the values, each of the pixel as a number that go from zero, black, to white. Okay, we are talking about computer science, right? Two to zero to 2.5, uh, one byte. And basically is from totally black to totally white. The numbers, two, five, six different combinations of gray colors, <coughs> black and white. Something that the system is going to ask you. The data set include the gray colors. The data set is something like this. You can use the data set like this values from zero to 255 or you can say you know what i want to use only zeros and ones can you use only zeros and ones yes. what do you do zero is zero 255 is one what about the values in the middle You define a value that is the put, and you define if maybe this guy here, 173, you are going to be white. Oh, wait, this 52, you are, you are zero. You can train your neural net with the gray column, or you can decide, you know what, I am going to train only the identification of black and white. If you do black and white, your input become the same input that you have for the X or zero one zero one zero one combination. Obviously, in a real scenario, I am sure that you want to consider the gray colors and later the colors, because well, even if I do a number here, as you can notice, not everything is black or white, and probably this line here, particularly, is going to be lost if I use the side line. So we can use the numbers. <coughs> that is the information that is going to be inside of your data set. Good news. That is going to be used encapsulated inside of the black box. You're not going to be working with these values, but it's a good idea to understand what is going to happen inside, period. 28 by 28, 
And you know what? The data set have a total of Seventy thousand images, seventy thousand pictures. So twenty-eight by twenty-eight columns, and this is the number of rows, and that is your data set. Uh, hopefully, now you agree with me why it was important to move the arrays outside of the Java virtual machine. This is something that is not small. You can try to create in your Java virtual machine an array to the array with 7A4 times 30,000. It's going to be interesting to have that array. And moreover, if you need two, because we're going to do operations, it's going to be more interesting. The library is going to put that array outside in the heap. Well, okay, we need to load this data. Uh, you need to create an array and then read each picture, pixel by pixel, and create this table. I am sure that if I ask you to do it, you can do it. Right? Read the information, the image, get the pixels, and fill this table with zero, one, or zeros on the numbers. You can do it. Uh, it could be a good exercise for programming. You do not need to do it. Tell me, software design, what do we need to create a data structure for data, in particular for this data, one solution. One solution, this guy, each of these rows can be an element in a dynamic data structure. Why I am worried about the dynamic data structure now? Because this is a lot of information. I am going to assume, or I am going to mention this, uh, just to make the concept. That I know you. Imagine that you have a linked list and each of the nodes is one of these rows. What do you need to use the linked list? To be honest, you do not need the linked list. What you need it's an iterator to the linked list. Iterator. There is a design pattern called <laughs> iterator. What is the goal of the iterator as a pattern or the iterator that you know in the Java collection? Provide you with access to data? Ah, okay, iterators. We understand iterators, access to data. And access to data, and you don't care about what is the collection. If you have an iterator, the iterator is enclosing whatever is the complexity of the data structure that you're using. You don't care that it's an iterator to a linked list or a queue or a stack. Give me access to the data. I don't care how this data is going to be stored in the memory, but if you can give me an iterator for that data, I can access the data and that's all my problem. What if I told you that this class exists in the library? Huh? Yep, the first word is the name of the data set. I already mentioned data set iterator. That object is going to solve our problem. That object is going to solve our problem. Now, three parameters that that object has, uh, you're going to notice. We're talking about in particular of this data set, the one with the numbers. Three things. The last one. Uh, what do you think is the meaning of this? It's there, but you can imagine. Zero, one versus the number. Ah, you want to use black and white or the gray? Binarize it, yes or no? Uh, hopefully you agree that this one is going to be true or false. True, black and white, false, Okay, uh, total number of samples. Total number of samples. Uh, total number of, what are the samples here? The columns or the rows? 
Ah, total number of rows, okay. The one is the only one important. Do you remember when you train your neural net, the one for the XOR? Do you remember that you have this for loop that run 10,000 times? And then inside you have another for loop that run four times. And inside you have another for loop that run one time. You train the neural net 10,000 times times four. Why this four? The number of inputs that you have. Obviously, these inputs were all what you have. The XOR, there is no more. That four that you have there, that values that you use in every iteration. For the XOR, it's always all the data you use it in every iteration. We do not have more. For these pictures, uh, we have 70,000 data. We're going to use the 70,000 data for every time that we do an iteration in this back propagation. And then we let use only a few of them. Like, let use. I don't know, 100 or 50 or 10. Let's define the size of our batch. We're going to use this batch for back propagation. And then for the next one, we use another batch. And for the next one, another batch, and so on. It's not going to be 7,500. Every iteration is going to be used as a subset. Remember, every iteration, we're calculating new Ws and buyers. We do not need to use all of them every time so we calculate the Ws and the bias. A few of them change the Ws and the bias. And again, another few of them, Ws and bias, another few, the bias, and so on. That block, our bunch. Clear? Easy. So we're going to load, yes. So in the 10,000 iterations, uh, will we keep using the same batch or will we use different? Different one. Uh, we can reuse the same one, but it is better to change the batch. So we are trying to modify the Ws and the bias better. So really, if I put 100 there or 50, the idea is 0 to 50, uh, 51 mm -hmm. to 100, 101 to, and so on. And it keeps going in a cycle? Yeah, the best thing that we can do is, for instance, here, if I define the bash with 100, the loop that is going to be running this batch, remember, before we have this 10,004, now for this problem, if this is 100, and we have a total of what we can have is now a for loop 700 times with batch size uh, 100, so every uh, 70, 100 cover all the data. That could be something that I can define. But if I define more, like 1,400, 1,400, then I could use every input two times. It's up to me, my training. Good. What we're going to do is something like that. Every entry one time <laughs> for the training. Good. Okay, this is a lot of theory. You are thinking, yeah. Uh, why can't we use all the input? What? Why can't we use all the input? In you can situation? do it. You can do it. There is no limitation about to not do it. Uh, it is possible. This is one thing. Another thing is use all of them. The only thing that we're here is remember, we need to balance the performance, the time. I mean, best case scenario is use all of them in every cycle. The problem that we have is time. It's going to consume more time using all of them in every cycle, but use a few of them. That is the only balance here. In some point, if we can run this faster, uh, we don't care about repeating things with the same data or different data. Now, moving. A lot of theory. Let's go. 
load the data set. Blah, 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 blah. The images, the tables, the numbers, the colors. Object oriented programming, software engineering. Can you help me to understand what is happening there? Do we get the idea? Remember that we mentioned that the total data set is 70. So 60 and 10. Yeah, 70. Uh, remember that we need training and then we need to do testing for your XOR. We use for training and testing exactly the same data set. Yeah, we only have four inputs for rows. Not a thing that we can do with images and with all this data. We can decide, okay, let's use some of these for training, some of these for testing. And you know what? The one that I am going to use for testing was not used for training. So my model do not know this new data because I never use for the training part. There is no bias. It's not something that I give you before. It's new. A total 70,000, 60 and 10. Good enough. Again, the decision is yours about this split. You tell me here, remember? The second parameter, how many rows do you want? Okay, I want one table with 60 and I want another table with only 10. Uh, true at the end, what is the true? Remember this idea of black and white? Okay. This example in particular is, yeah, let's do it. False, let's not do it. Uh, 100. Yeah, we are going to use 100, 100, 100, 100, and one is going to be a total of 10,000, the other 60,000, and we're going to use batches of 100 data. Can be different. Can we use batches of 10 or 200 or 50, whatever? Your decision for the training. What? Yeah. What difference would it make if we do a batch of 10 or a thousand? Where? What difference would it make? Nothing really. I mean, the total number of data that you have is uh, 70. Uh, you split 60 and 10. That's it. You can do 50 and 20, or you can do 40 and 10. And there are going to be data that you are not using. Fine. For the batch you are creating, I am creating here 100. We can create later 50, 20, 10. Uh, bigger the data set, less iterations that you do, more data that you put for the training that you are doing to calculate the W values. So what do we want to do? More back propagation. The batches should be smaller because then I am going to run more times the back propagation. That basically means the derivatives. Uh, remember, every time that you run the derivative, the value move. And the idea is to move down. So I need, I want to run the derivative several times. I want to move this data several times, or I prefer to have more data to one calculation. Uh, the balance is something that we need to check. Is something that you always can modify. The, the thing here, the challenge in machine learning, is that none of these numbers have a value that is perfect. The real challenge, your work as an engineer, is to figure out, uh, it's not guessing. It's an informed, educated guess. The value for this constant, the size of the batch, the number of nodes in the layer, how many layers, the learning rate, all these things are the things that you need to decide. How? I am going to give you hints, but no answer is going to be good for every single case. 
if we train it with the total 70,000 iteration of with all the 70,000 data and we if we uh, test with the same 70,000 data, will there be an error rate because? You can do it. Uh, the assumption is that you've seen the data for testing that you already used for training is usually something that you do not want to do. Usually you want to separate this data because the worst case scenario, something that could happen is the data that you use for training, uh, some of this data can create a bias in the model and therefore make the model to identify those elements. But maybe, just maybe, your model works perfectly for that particular data, but not for all. Uh, what you want to do is test with something that the network never knew, values that you never use for the derivatives, that is basically the idea, because then you can check if really your model works for every case, quotation mark, or not. So as a recommendation, as a advice, something that you should do, try to use different data for the training and the testing. Again, in our previous example, we use the same because we do not have more. If you do not have more, I mean, you need to test, right? So nothing can be done. But if you have the option like this, we have the option, separate data to use the testing. Do not repeat training and testing with the same data. Is use recommendation. What will happen if you do not do it? Uh, worst case scenario, your testing is going to tell you your model is perfect. But then when new data, different data come from, uh, you are going to notice, oops, it was not so good. Okay. Good guys. Don't. That is the only thing that you need to do to load the data set in your program. Two lines done. What happened with the URL from the data set inside of the library? And the format of the table, the data inside of the library. This is the only thing that you need. Pretty good, right? Next. Uh, for software design, the pattern iterator, I just want to be sure that you remember the iterator, the concrete one, is the one communicating with the collection. The only thing that you need is the iterator and you have access to the collection, period. But software design. Anyway, moving forward, here. We have the data. We need to create the model. Training is going to be something that comes after, but right now we need the model. Uh, model. Can you agree with these key ideas? Let's just start with a model that is simple. Let's just start with a model that have one layer for the input, one for the output, and one in the middle. That is the best solution? No, I am just starting with the basics. Uh, starting with the basics, uh, three layers, well, input, output, and one layer in the middle. The question that you could have is how many inputs, how many outputs? Can you agree with me if I told you that we need seven, eight, four inputs? You give me that number before. Can you agree if I tell you that we need 10 outputs? Yes. For the first time, you're not going to be one neuron in the output. 10. Why 10? 10 characters. 10 categories. Uh, previously, in the output was 0 or 1. The XOR. So one output and that output 0 or 1, 2 or 4. No. Now I want to know which is the number. Which is the number? The apple. Same value. And they are going to give me, or what I want, the probability of whatever is the input is a one, the probability is a two, the probability is a three, the probability, and so on. Professor, according with that idea, in your previous example, the one with the XOR, why not we have two outputs? Because you have zero or one. So why not two outputs 
and one is the probability of a zero, and the other is the probability of a one. Can you tell me why not? We can calculate the other by we can calculate the probability of the other value. Uh, if I add you to have two, uh, one is the negative, the opposite of the other. Yeah. I mean, if here is 0.7, uh, this should be 0.3 to keep the balance. So really, in your example with the XOR, you do not need two because one is giving you both values. But now with 10 categories, the situation is different. Okay. What happened with the layer in the middle? Because I have here uh, seven, eight, four, and I have here 10. The only number that I need is how many nodes in the middle? And that is a very hard decision. Another engineering decision. The number of nodes in the middle layer. Because the input is easy. The output is easy. Basically, if you check your data, you have that. The nodes in the middle. There is no rule for the nodes in the middle. There is no hard rule like it should be this. There are some ideas, some guidelines. Guidelines, uh, usually three are the important ones. Again, uh, I am going to share with you a paper on Canvas that talk about how to calculate the numbers of nodes in the layer. And what you're going to read in the paper is, uh, there are several options. That is the conclusion. Uh, several options, uh, usually for beginners. Option number one, the nodes in the middle layer, in the hidden layer, should be a number between the number in the input and the number in the output. Okay, it should be a number between seven, eight, four, and 10. Okay, good. Uh, rule number two, the number of nodes here in the middle should not be bigger than twice the number of inputs. Small than twice the number of inputs. Okay, at least that helped me to establish a maximum. Okay, you know what? The total number of nodes here should be two thirds of the input plus the output. Professor, every single one of those three rules, sometimes one contradicts the other. Because you can calculate the numbers and it's like, okay, one is like that number, but the other is not that number. They are options, guys. No number is going to solve every single problem. Now, the big picture, what do you get? with more nodes, what do you get with fewer nodes? What do you get with more layers? What do you get with only one layer? More nodes, more places in which you are running, more coefficients that you are calculating. The final result, is controlled by more Ws. Yes? Do you want to have more Ws or less Ws? You need a balance, but usually more Ws could help. I am not going to an infinite number of Ws, but think about an equation. More coefficients is higher the possibility that if you are looking for a particular curve that match this one with more coefficients, you can get closer. <laughs> However, 
also with more coefficients, something can go wrong and the thing crash. More is better than a few. You are not going to have a layer with only one or two. No, you need one more. But you need to be careful to do not have a lot more because you can make the thing crash. The only rule that I recommend you to follow and be aware of, never put more nodes than twice the number of nodes that you have in the input. Be aware with that. Be careful with that. Good? Okay. So in my example, can I use this number of nodes in the middle? Is more than my input. Is not between my input and my output. I broke one rule. Yeah, but I am taking care of the other. In particular, this one is not twice that number, but it's the one that I want to import. Uh, can I use this number? Well, that one is in the middle between the input and the output. Uh, can I use this number? Okay, the same. Can I use this number? Oh, okay, whatever. You're just complicating the thing. All these numbers should work. We're just going to select the number of nodes for our pre first approach. Later we can change, right? So this looks familiar. The data sets at the top, the same as we had before, but line 24 to 38. Everything else is the same as before, but 38, 24. Do we remember that flow? Maybe the same that we used before, but some numbers use happen to change. Uh, Layer zero, a dense layer, 784 inputs, uh, 794 outputs. Really? Sorry. Uh, you can change to this one. Solid number. Input output, please. The input, mandatory. The output, I am just playing with you. Output layer. But remember, it's just only one middle layer. Output, input, 794. Uh, 794. Output, 10. 10. Uh, the same thing that we did before. Any other things that we need to review? Uh, MSE, SIG mode. We have the model. Next, we need to train the model, right? Uh, to train the model, ah, we have the learning rate, right? still 0 0.7. Train the model. Do you remember this? It method. What was the parameter for seat? <laughs> A data set. Uh, before, if you go and review the previous one, the data set that we sent there was exactly the same <coughs> data set or the outputs of the same data set that we use for training. Now, if you review here, we create two data sets one data set for training and one data set for testing. The one for training is the one with 60,000, and the one for testing, test, my object in the 22 line is for the testing, right? I am sending train. I am sending the data set for training. And if you remember this feed is the method that is going to be calling forward propagation and back propagation and do all the maps. Exactly the same thing that we did for the export, right? 
Okay, now this is going to be training. Uh, did you notice the for loop? One for loop. Run this 100 times. Okay, whatever. Evaluation. Is this code familiar to something that we did before? We're creating an object evaluation. Uh, our object eval, similar to your homework. Uh, there is a parameter there for the constructor. Did we use the constructor before for evaluation in your homework? The constructor was empty. Do you remember that you create, we create for the XOR an evaluation object with empty constructor, no parameter? Now I am sending a parameter. The parameter is the number 10. What do you think is the meaning? Labels. Huh? Number of labels. Yes. Uh, Let's use number of labels, number of classes, categories that we want to predict. In the evaluation class that you are creating, your constructor is empty. That empty constructor is the one that is going to create a confusion metric of two by two, the default. Here, what we're going to have, what I am asking, is an evaluation object, and that evaluation object is for 10 classes. And if I have 10 classes, confusion metric, 10 by 10, predict the one or the two or the three or the four, and tell me if that prediction match with the real data. That parameter, 10 classes, really the size for the confusion metric. That is number of rows, number of columns. But you don't need to know that. You know it. Uh, later. Our method eval. Our method eval receives two parameters. Do you remember the parameters that you are sending to eval? You need to create the confusion metric, the predicted values, and the real values, because basically what you are going to do is to compare them, right? Real data versus predicted data. Real data. The real data is inside of this data set. The real data that you want from the data set is not the full data set. What you want is this, the output. In our example before, we said that the output. What I do if I have the data set, because the library gives you the data set, to only get the outputs, you know that the outputs are called the label. So there is a getter method, get the label, get the correct results. Parameter number one for eval, comma, parameter number two. Did you notice the relationship between this one and this one? What is predict two? The result of the method output in the model. The method output, the one that we used before, the same that I asked you to implement, that receive one parameter. Do you remember what is the parameter that you sent to the method output? The input, right? The input. Okay, the data set, but I want the input. For the training, we send everything. For the evaluation, I need this one. I need this one. Get labels, to get the labels. Get features, features, the X. I call output, I send the features, the input. In the testing data set, I am going to get predicted output. And then to the eval, I send the real values and the predicted ones, and eval is going to do the work. Check this slide versus the one that we had before. 
the same. XOR picture. What? Okay, what do you think about the result that we're going to get? I want to know the confusion metric. I want to know the F1 score and so on. The only thing that I need to do is to call the method stacks from Meval. Uh, that is something that we did before. The source code that we have now, I am going to do exactly the same thing. Because calling that stack in Neval is going to tell me how good or bad my model performs. And the result that you're going to get if you run my model is going to be this picture. And the question that I have for you is, did we do a good more or not? Okay, everyone can notice that our model is garbage. What happened? Don't worry, we're going to improve it. I just want to show you what happened when you just put numbers there and things can happen, things can go wrong. That is our first step. My point here is, how do we know that this is wrong? Number one, the easy thing, the first thing that I ask you to notice is confusion metric. Remember that the diagonal should be the one with the highest value. And this diagonal is pretty bad. I mean, we have zeros in the diagonal. Okay, forget about the matrix. Let's go to the numbers. Accuracy, 0 0.09. What is the best value for accuracy? So that is almost zero. What is the best value for precision and recall? Almost zero. And well, the F1 score is just a combination of repetition and recall. Pretty bad thing. Why? <coughs> Why? Things that I did wrong. Number one, remember our friend, the six mod function? Okay, our friend, the six mod function is very good if what you are predicting is values. Remember that for the X4, we were predicting values. Zero or one, one the result. With the pictures, we are predicting values. What we want to predict? Classes. The class directly, more specifically, Probabilities. Problem number one, because my model is garbage. Sig mod is for values, zero or one as a value, X or the output is zero or one. They are not probabilities. What we want to do in our neural net is to predict probabilities. So we're using an equation that is not for probabilities. Error number one. What else? Do you remember another function that we're using? The error function, which one are we using? MSE. Uh, that one is a very good function to calculate the error between values. One value compared with the other and the difference is the error. For the picture, we want to predict the error regarding two values or regarding two? Again, probabilities of a class to be. You know what is my problem and what I am getting this zero garbage thing? The sigma and the MSP equation. It's not the only one, but we can start there. What I want you to notice is what happened when we're using this powerful tool, neural network. And we can have everything in order, the parameters and so on. We follow the specification, whatever, but we select back something. And something in particular 
our equation. Okay, I am going to stop here. Next lecture, we fix the equations and other things. Thank you.